All right, so to get started, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Hiro Shibuya. Um, is a podiatric surgeon and a professor at Texas A&M College of Medicine in Temple, Texas. Um, there, he specializes in treating foot and ankle deformities and injuries. Um, and so he's going to start, start us off tonight discussing the role of dynamic compression using the Dynanail in treating diabetic patients. Okay. Anybody hear me okay? All right. So everybody's time is precious, so I'm just going to get into it. And I'm just going to talk about the compression nail for diabetic patients. So if you're joining this webinar, you probably see this all the time in your practice. And you know, back in the days, the choice was very easy. That it's just apodesis. The last 10 years or so, there are a lot of advan uh, advances in uh, total ankle arthroplasty. So a lot of the patients, especially in my practice, you know, 60 to 70 percent of the patients actually go into the arthroplasty. Uh, in this type of pathology. But of course, the uh, arthroplasty is not the solution for everyone. There are a lot of contraindications, especially those people who are young and active and you know the implant doesn't last too long, or patient is obese, or if, if the patient has a severe deformity, or if the patient is high risk. So by the time you select this uh, arthrodesis, you're going to have a lot of patients who are not in a good shape. You know, when I see this, uh, this is a failed agility. Um, if I see this, back in the days, you know, it's no-brainer. Just apodesis, try to salvage this, uh, maybe bone graft or no, without bone graft. Uh, but nowadays, if the patient is healthy enough, we, I try to salvage with the arthroplasty uh, procedures. Uh, so back in the days, the choices are either simple screw fixation versus enhanced uh, I am nail or enhanced fixation, but nowadays those uh, much uh, less risky, uh, healthier patients, uh, you know, the arthroplasty is an option. So by the time we select this procedure, TTC arthrodesis or just a simple ankle fusions, by the time you select the procedures, you're dealing with a lot of high risk patients. When I deal with high risk patients, I'm talking about a lot of diabetic patients, especially in my practice. A lot of the high risk patients are diabetic patients. So uh, here's my study. I uh, I look at the diabetic patients in my uh, institution, the in, uh, Baylor Conway system, and I look at the people who had a bone healing complication versus people who didn't have bone healing complications. And then just look at the diabetic patients. And we try to come up with the risk factors that are associated with the bone healing complications, including non-unions, delay unions, and the charcoal arthropathy. And when I adjust for all the covariates, those interaction between the risk factors, I came up with three independent risk factors that are associated with bone healing complications in diabetic patients. One is high, more than 7% glycated hemoglobin. And surgery time every 10 minutes is actually associated with a bone healing complication by a factor of 1.15, which is 15% increase in risk of bone healing complications every 10 minutes. But the biggest risk factor that was associated with the bone healing complication was actually neuropathy. If you're a diabetic and having neuropathy, you are four times as likely to have bone healing complication compared to those without neuropathy, but they're still diabetic. So neuropathy by far is the biggest risk factor. And when I did this, the vascular problem wasn't even a risk factor for the bone healing complication. So again, neuropathy is the biggest thing. So what happens in regular surgery, whenever you do surgery on the patient's foot and ankle, whatever the surgery it is, it causes inflammation. And the first three days of a bone healing cycle is an inflammatory uh, cycle. You get a lot of osteoclastic activity to try to clean up the bone debris. And that itself is going to cause inflammation. So this process happens the first three days of post-operative period. And naturally, there's an anti-inflammatory pathway. So eventually, this anti-inflammatory pathway kicks in and stops this cycle and eventually go on to the bone healing. However, when you're talking about neuropathic diabetic patients, this anti-inflammatory pathway is inhibited. So this cyclic pathological inflammation just go out of control and osteoclastic activity keeps going and going 
resulting in the catabolic activity and eventually bone resorption. You know, normal patients get bone resorption too, but the, these diabetic neuropathic patients do get excessive bone resorption. A lot of times end up in sharp arthropathy or just a simple non-union with a lot of gaps between the bone fragments. This is a good example. This is a diabetic charcoal recontraction with a static uh, fixation on my own patient. I put a lot of bone grafts, a lot of cytokines in between the bone graft, uh, bone fragments. But what happens over 20 weeks? Because of neuropathy, you're going to have bone resorption, and there's no bone-to-bone -bone contact. You lose friction, and you lose the stability, and go into non-union for those patients. So what's going on with the micro level, the molecular level? So this is a study we did in a, a rat femur. This is a diabetic rat neuropathic femur. I'm not just talking about knockout gene, the rat model. This is actually fat rat with the neuropathy. So you fracture the femur, and if you try to fixate it with the uh, IM uh, pen, we measure the cytokines and inflammatory uh, markers in the, the, the blood vessels. And what we found out, you know, people think a lot of things are down-regulated on those patients, but actually the growth factors and the pro-inflammatory cytokines are actually elevated on diabetic and neuropathic rats. So it's not that you have to put more into it. You actually have to down-regulate it to try to inhibit the inflammatory cycle to try to uh, stop the inflammation and catabolic activity and the bone resorption of those patients. So what do you have to do for this? You can use uh, resorption inhibitors such as bisphosphonate. You know, we've been using that for charcoal for years now. Calstonin and the vancolagin antagonist becoming more and more popular. So this is a medical treatment to try to stop the, the, the pathological cycle and the inflammatory path, pathway. Surgically, what can you do? Well, you just assume the resorption is going to happen in those, those patients. It happens on everyone, but especially in diabetic neuropathic patients because of the pathway I showed you, you're going to have a lot of resorption between the bones. And when you're dealing with the ankle bone, you could do the dynamic compression nail in order to keep closing the gap so you don't lose compression. You don't have a gap, and you could just stay stable throughout the time of healing, which can take significantly longer time in diabetic neuropathic patients. So here's the static uh, stabilization I did on my business card. So I have this the plastic wrap, nice and tightly wrapped. But I have to give away some of the business card to my patient. So I take out some business card. As soon as I do that, what's going to happen? You're going to lose friction between the business card, and you're going to have a very unstable bunch of uh, business cards. As opposed to if I use a rubber band around the business card, you could give away some of the business card to my patient, and you could just push it from every direction and still stays intact because rubber band keeps compressing on it, friction between the business card still remains high and stable. So that's the concept of dynamic compression. So this is an example. This is a charcoal patient, early charcoal. This is not bad enough to do the below the knee amputation. This is the fifth metatarsal head ulceration, you have to strain this. You know, normally you want to do the arthrobesis, but again, the surgery time, you don't want to cause trauma. So I prep this joint typically with the arthroscopic measure. You just, you know, try to find the bone fragment, try to debride it, do everything through the arthroscope, no incision made whatsoever, and you just throw dyna dynamic compression nail because you know the in order to have charcoal, the patient has to have a severe neuropathy, at least to the level of the ankle joint. So you assume you're going to have a lot of bone resorption. So you have to keep filling the gap in addition to medical treatment for those patients with the bone resorption inhibitors. Another case, simple PR4, but in diabetic patients, this is very deadly. And you try to minimize the trauma, you do the percutaneous fixation, but you know that's not going to be enough and it's going to collapse. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to prep the joint. And you're going to have to do the arthrodesis, but you don't want to do arthrodesis with a big incision in this type of patient. So I'm going to try to prep the joint with the arthroscopic measure so you don't make any incision. I don't cause extra inflammation, and they just throw that dynamic uh, dynamic compression nail so that the bone resorption 
cap is created, but keep compressing the gap so it remains stable throughout the process of healing, again, which is going to take very long time in a uh, and diabetic neuropathic patient. You can see that uh, the, you get about seven millimeter of compression, and all the resorption is uh, taken up by this uh, dynamic compression nail. And last case here, um, third case is uh, osteomyelitis of lateral malleolus from uh, diabetic ankle fracture again. Uh, hardware is already taken out. Uh, you have to resect it out. It's kind of a septic fusion at this point. Uh, you could do a dynamic compression with external fixation, of course. It's a very good way of doing it, except those patients are very high risk. So you're going to have a lot of pin site problems. And again, the bone healing is very slow on these patients, so you're going to have to have external fixation for a very long time until the bone is healed, you know, which a lot of times we can afford to do, so we just replace it with the dynamic compression nail without any uh, transfixation wires. So even the gap is created, this time the ankle joint is already pre prepared, so I didn't have to make any incision, just through the nail and try to compress it out of it and eventually you're going to achieve fusion. And if you notice in the last couple of cases, if you notice, I only prepped the ankle joints on those cases, but if you see the subtalar joint, they're actually also fused. I didn't even touch the subtalar joint, but because of a lot of compression and the natural osteoclastic activity caused by the diabetic neuropathy, you know, my theory is that they keeps breaking down the joint that's compressed, you know, the traumatized, and eventually it's going to go on to heal without even pre preparing the joint. So in conclusion, that uh, you know the biggest thing that uh, I usually tell the residents and these diabetic neurotic patients is that uh, the inflammation is a problem. A lot of it is a medical problem. You could treat it medically with the anti-inflammatory uh, inhibitors, or in surgically, what can you do? You just assume the bone resorption and keep closing the gap with the dynamic compression technique. Thank you.